So our next speaker is uh, Dr. Joseph Takahashi. So Dr. Dr. Takahashi will be a treat as well. Doc, uh, Dr. Takahashi is um, a Howard Hughes investigator at UT Southwestern. He's the chair of the neuroscience department there. And he's somebody who has used forward genetics to study circadian rhythms uh, for um, the recent part of his career. Um, he was um, educated, as I just found out this morning, he's, he started his PhD education at UT Austin and then moved up to Oregon and finished his uh, PhD in Oregon and then um, moved to uh, Northwestern University and spent um, a good long time from 1983 to 2009 at Northwestern and then in 2010, 2009, he was recruited to UT Southwestern um, to do his work there. Dr. Takahashi does forward genetics in um, in studying the circadian, uh, in, in studying the circadian rhythm, um, he he uses uh, cloning in the mouse as a discovery tool for the genes that under underlie the neurobiology and the behavior of the human clock genes. Dr. Takahashi discovered um, many of the human, um, many of the clock genes in um, mammalian systems, both mouse and human, and we'll now have Dr. Takahashi talk with us about his work. Thanks, Joe. <clears throat> Thanks, Carol. <clears throat> Thank you, Carol. It's uh, really a pleasure to be here. Um, I do have one disclosure uh, with Reset Therapeutics. So I think all of us are aware that we live on a planet that has a 24-hour cycle, light and darkness, and one way that we like to think about this environmental cycle is that it's really an energetic cycle. Uh, you could understand this in photosynthetic plants, for example, but uh, even in organisms and in humans, uh, we go through uh, many behavioral cycles, uh, sleep-wake, feeding and fasting, and across uh, really all life forms, uh, a internal biological clock has uh, evolved that involves a transcriptional cycle in which a special set of genes turns on and off each day. <clears throat> now, the, the real beginning of the field uh, started in 1971 with this seminal paper from Ron Kanopka and Seymour Benzer at Caltech. Uh, Ron, a, then a graduate student, isolated three mutations in Drosophila that affected the period of the, of the clock. Uh, one shortened, one lengthened, and one abolished the clock here. They all mapped to one gene, the period locus, uh, but it took many years to ultimately find the gene. Uh, last year's Nobel Prize was awarded for that discovery. Uh, and it took even longer uh, for such genes to be found in mammals. So uh, our story really began in around the 1990s where we decided to undertake a genetic approach similar to Kanopka and Benzer. And instead of uh, directly trying to find genes in mice, what we did was to take a foregenetic phenotypic approach uh, and to use uh, the mouse activity rhythm, a behavioral assay, and to screen for uh, mutants in mice that had been randomly mutagenized with a point mutagen called ethyl nitrosourea. And so in this screen done by Martha Vita Turner in my lab, uh, she discovered this mutant mouse. These are actograms. The, the black represents when the mouse is running on a wheel. Each line is two days of data, and this is a pretty long experiment, over 50 days of data. At the beginning, the mouse is on a light cycle, it runs at night, rests in the daytime, and then here it's transferred to darkness and it reveals its endogenous periodicity, which is about 23.7 hours in the case of a C57 black 6 mouse. And in the screen, Martha found this mouse. It can synchronize to light, but when released into darkness, it has a 28 hour clock. It wakes up four hours later each day and then after a couple of weeks, the rhythm damps out, and what's left is this episodic uh, activity pattern. 
Now, this mutation was caused by single uh, gene mutation in mouse chromosome 5. Uh, it took my lab 30 person years of effort to go from that mouse to the gene. I'm not going to, uh, or I'm going to spare you the details today. But the <clears throat> predicted gene, which we were able to name clock, uh, was very interesting because it was clearly a transcription factor. It had a DNA binding motif, BHLH region, uh, and then it had a glutamine-rich C-terminal region, which is characteristic of activator proteins. Now, if we fast forward to the, uh, the present, uh, clock interacts with another BHLH pass protein called BMAL1. Uh, more recently, we solved the crystal structure for the BHLH pass AB domains for this heterodimeric complex. Uh, this is where it binds DNA. And then these pass domains are interesting protein protein uh, interaction interfaces. Clock uh, acts as a transcriptional activator. I'll show you uh, examples in a while. But Two of the major sets of target genes for clock are uh, that original fly protein called period, also found in mammals. <clears throat> uh, in humans, there are three period paralogs, and the first two, PER1 and PER2, are the most critical. Uh, and then there's a second set of proteins uh, called the cryptochrome proteins. There are also two paralogs, CRY1 and CRY2. These are activated in the daytime. The proteins accumulate. Uh, they actually interact with each other with, as well as with other proteins, such as casein kinase 1 epsilon. They translate back, back into the nucleus in the evening, where they repress uh, their own transcription. And so I'll come back to this uh, uh, cell autonomous clock system in a moment. The other beginning in the field also occurred in the early 70s, and this was 1972, when the superchiasmatic nucleus of the hypothalamus was discovered. Uh, and it was done by two groups, Bob Moore's group, Irving Zucker's group, using lesioning methods. Uh, and they showed that both the adrenal corticosterone rhythm and the behavioral drinking rhythm in rats was abolished when the SCN was lesioned. Now, the SCN today we know uh, is a pretty interesting structure. Uh, it receives direct retinal input, which uh, terminates in a core region of the nucleus, uh, which is best represented by the neuropeptide VIP shown here. And the core is then surrounded by a shell represented by the peptide vasopressin shown here. Uh, most of the outputs uh, are thought to emerge from the shell. Uh, and here is shown an organotypic slice containing the SCN in culture from a mouse that uses a luciferase reporter driven by the PER2 gene. And this allows us to visualize the abundance of PER2 within the uh, tissues. And what you can see in this uh, week-long recording <coughs> is there's this beautiful rhythm of PER2 uh, bioluminescence in the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Uh, and you can also see this wave-like pattern uh, because the cells are synchronized to each other. So there's a coordinated, coherent rhythm in, in the nucleus. Now, <clears throat> uh, if you knock out the partner of clock, BMAL, uh, in, in excitatory neurons, uh, or cam uh, camkinase 2 containing neurons using conditional Crelox technology. These are the control mice. They all look normal. They're on LD, DD, LD, LL, and then back onto LD. But when you knock out BMAL in the brain, the animal completely loses its rhythm. So BMAL is critical for behavioral rhythms. Uh, within the nucleus, <clears throat> uh, there are many different uh, subtypes of neurons, and a third kind of neuron is uh, marked by the neuropeptide NMS, or neuromedin S. Uh, this peptide is interesting because it um, covers at least 40% of the neurons and includes 95% of the VIP and 
vasopressin neuropeptide types. Uh, and so <clears throat> using uh, Crelux and tetracycline dependent technology, we can then uh, manipulate just these NMS neurons. And in this case, what we're doing is we're driving a clock mutant transgene, which makes the period long. Uh, and this, as you can see here, makes the behavior long. These are all the controls, which are normal. Uh, and then when we turn off the transgene with doxycycline, the period goes back to normal. So this shows that it's sufficient to change the period in this subset of neurons and then ultimately affect the overall behavior of the animal. Uh, now, is it uh, necessary? So to do that, we can conditionally delete BMAL in only NMS neurons within the suprachiasmatic nucleus. And here, the controls are normal. Uh, and then two examples of the conditional deletion. What we see here is an interesting phenotype. The mice initially maintain a rhythm when released into darkness for up to three weeks. But then spontaneously, you can see that the rhythm falls apart and ultimately uh, is lost, similar to the global knockout. So this shows that this subset of neurons is really critical uh, for the generation of behavioral rhythms uh, and really defines an uh, important subset of cells within the suprachiasmatic nucleus. Now, I'd like to return <clears throat> to this, uh, what we call the core mechanism of the clock. Uh, one of the surprises in gene cloning was that these genes are expressed not only in the brain, but throughout the entire body. And so, for example, if you look at fibroblasts that have this PER2 luciferase reporter, using imaging, you can measure single cell circadian rhythms. So these are two examples of circadian rhythms uh, measured over 18 days in culture. Each of these individual fibroblasts has incredibly robust rhythms that go for as long as we can measure them. But unlike the SCN, they don't synchronize to each other. They drift apart. So macroscopically, the culture desynchronizes and damps out. Uh, but this has led to the idea that uh, cells are really found throughout the body, not just the SCN in the brain, but all of our major organ systems contain circadian oscillators that are driven by this cell autonomous oscillator system. <clears throat> Now, I'd like to go back to this core loop. Here's a little bit more detail uh, where I've separated the PER and cryptochrome pair logs. Uh, we think that most inputs come in through the PER1 and PER2 genes through classical immediate early gene uh, signaling pathways that involve uh, calcium, cyclic AMP, and serum response element uh, proteins. Uh, and we think that most of the outputs are actually transcriptional, as I'll show you in a moment. Now, this core uh, clock network is actually uh, w buried within a larger circadian transcriptional network. And so here, we see two other loops that are driven by clock BMAL. So here's a second loop uh, driving the nuclear receptor rev reverb alpha. Uh, which oscillates, and reverb is a very strong repressor of ROR activated transcription. Um, and so one of the targets of this loop is BMAL and clock itself. Okay. A third loop shown here, also driven by clock BMAL, is the transcription factor DBP. It's a par zip transcription factor, it's an activator. It is repressed by another protein called NFIL3, important in T cell development and immunology. Uh, NFIL3 is a very strong repressor, and this leads to a third uh, transcriptional feedback loop. Now, these three loops are interdependent. They're all driven by clock BMAL, uh, but they're also interlocked. They're not in parallel. And what's interesting about them is that by different combinations of regulation by these three loops, you can get very wide ranges in gene expression. So for example, here, DBP and light blue peaks at eight. It's a pure clock BMAL-driven gene. PER2 
peaks later. It's mainly an E-box, D-box gene. Uh, CRY1, shown in red, comes later. It's mainly an ROR uh, E-box gene. And then finally, BMAL, shown in dark blue here, uh, is even later, and it's primarily a nuclear receptor regulated gene. Uh, now, all three of these pathways also have their own transcriptional output pathways. Now, using ChIP-seq, <coughs> uh, we can now try to identify where these transcription factors bind in the genome and identify their target genes. So here's a ChIP-seq profile at that third transcription factor, DBP. You can see three sites, one in the promoter, one in intron one, and one in intron two. And then these are si samples taken at six different times of day, where zero is morning, uh, 4, 8, 12, that would be daytime, and then 16 and 20 are at night. And what you can see is that the binding of BMAL is fluctuating. It's high in the daytime, low at night. If we look at the entire core loop, clock and BMAL are activating uh, and working together in the daytime, and then the four repressors bind the same sites, but they occupy DNA at night. Um, <clears throat> and CRY1 has a third pattern. It comes on even later at 20, peaks at dawn at zero, and then falls off at four. Uh, so the entire transcriptional feedback loop is cycling uh, in the mouse liver, in this case, uh, at many thousands of sites. And if we compare the location of binding of all six factors in the genome, we see a very highly enriched group of genes here in the middle. <clears throat> And these genes uh, are highly enriched for metabolic pathways as well as other signaling pathways. So just to give you a feeling for what uh, metabolic pathways means in this context, here's a chart of metabolic pathways in the cell. They're color-coded. Uh, glycolysis is blue, lipid metabolism is green. And overlaid in red are all the, the BMAL target genes. And so really, the message here is that the entire chart is covered, uh, which uh, to us was remarkable at the time, because what it's telling us is that the clock is really fine-tuning all metabolic pathways in a cell autonomous way. So this picture is from the liver, but if we look in the brain, we actually see a very similar picture, where metabolic pathways is always a top gene ontology category. Uh, and so we think that uh, this is actually one of the fundamental roles the clock is playing uh, across many cell types. Uh, that is to fine tune transcription in a cell autonomous way. So maybe it doesn't make sense to have the clock and the brain have to signal all the way to the liver, go into the nucleus, uh, and mobilize, uh, mobilize a gene program there every day. Why not just do it locally? Okay. Now, in addition to those transcription factors, we see a number of chromatin changes throughout the day uh, in the mouse liver. So these are six classic histone chromatin marks uh, that are associated with transcription uh, that Eric Nessler already uh, mentioned to you before. <clears throat> uh, and what's really interesting in these data is if you look at this histone 3 lysine 4 trimethyl mark, which is a classic mark for promoters. This mark is highly dynamic, so at 0 and 4, it's not there. Then it peaks at 12, and then it goes away. These activation marks, which are acetylation marks, are also cycling. Uh, that's not so surprising since they're associated with transcription. Um, <clears throat> so this led us to look at uh, polymerase II itself, uh, because these marks are all uh, associated with RNA polymerase II transcription. So here's uh, the, that second loop gene, NR1D1 or reverb alpha. Uh, it's on the minus strand, so it's going from right to left. And these are the BMAL sites in the gene. There's one at the promoter, there are three intronic enhancer sites, and then two upstream clock enhancer sites. And then this 
is uh, RNA polymerase II uh, chip seek profiles taken over two days. So there are two cycles of data here every four hours. And here what you can see is that polymerase is at the promoter is recruited and the abundance is cycling, it's circadian. We can also see it at these in intronic enhancers as well as four upstream enhancers for this gene. Uh, the clock BMAL site you can see is also cycling as far as uh, polymerase abundance. <clears throat> and you can see polymerase elongating in the gene body here and here during the peak of transcription. Uh, and you can see it uh, accumulating in the termination site here and here after elongation. So Paul II is clearly under circadian control. And what was surprising <clears throat> is that this is occurring at many thousands of genes in the mouse liver. Over 5,000 genes have cycling Paul II on them. Um, now, if we look at different isoforms of Paul II, we can try to understand how, what the clock is doing. So this antibody detects what's thought to be newly recruited Paul II. And so we can see it at the promoter and all these enhancer sites, and it's cycling at all of these sites. So this suggests that recruitment of Paul II is under circadian control. Uh, the first step in transcription is initiation, and there's a mark that's put on Paul II at the serine 5 position. And this form of polymerase is also under circadian control, both at the promoter, all the enhancer sites, and you can see it elongating in the gene body. So both initiation and recruitment are under circadian control. Um, but in addition, uh, polymerase is regulated uh, by other steps after initiation. So the polymerase typically pauses downstream from the start site. This is regulated by pausing factors such as NELF and SPT5 or DSIF. And what we can see is these factors are also recruited to the pr promoter and enhancer sites of this gene. Uh, and they are also under circadian control. Um, now, to measure transcription directly, we use a different technique, which is called ProSeq, uh, which allows us to directly measure uh, nascent transcription uh, in, in nuclei. And this signal looks a lot like Paul II. There's a peak at the promoter, which is due to pausing. It elongates in the gene body, and it accumulates at the three prime end. Uh, in addition, we can see the pause, which occurs 30 to 60 base pairs downstream from the transcription start site using this method. <clears throat> and so if we look at ProSeq signal at the NR1 gene, we see in the black histograms, because it's on the minus strand of DNA, uh, there's a beautiful rhythm of transcription and elongation from ProSeq. And also, you can see the four upstream enhancers also have non-coding RNA transcripts, which are called enhancer RNAs, or eRNAs, which we now know are uh, a mark of active enhancer use uh, in the genome. So is there pausing regulation? Uh, the one answer is yes. NELF, the pausing factor itself, is under circadian occupancy across the whole genome. If we look at the ProSeq pausing signal, we can also see that it is under circadian control. Uh, and we think that these contribute to the major peak in steady state mRNA cyclic genes. So every step of Paul II regulation that we've looked at uh, shows evidence of circadian regulation, recruitment, initiation, uh, pausing, pause release, and elongation. Uh, and it's really uh, so, somewhat remarkable uh, that the clock is having such a global effect on gene transcription. And so in the mouse liver, we see this incredibly regulated gene program that, that occurs every day. Uh, so in the middle of the day, there's this major activation phase where the activators such as clock and BMAL occupy DNA. They recruit uh, 
Co-activators such as CBP and P300, we can see these peaking at this time, and we can see some histone acetylation marks also uh, peaking at this time. This is followed by this burst of transcription recruitment of RNA polymerase II, uh, and then we get the classic repression phase where the PER and CRI proteins occupy DNA, shut off transcription, those repressors turn over, and then we go into the following cycle. Uh, so this is the mouse liver. Um, is there a similar picture in the brain? I don't have time to show you all the details um, today, but the answer is we do see uh, a very similar picture in brain. Brain is more complex, uh, but it's clear that many thousands of genes are cycling in our brains on a circadian fashion, uh, and we're beginning to look at uh, the regulation of Pol2 and chromatin state as a function of time of day in, in the brain as well. Now, for the second half of my talk, I'd like to sort of switch gears and talk about a new area uh, that has become more of an interest, especially to me as I age, <clears throat> and that is really to look at the importance of time in both food intake and metabolic processing of it, as well as classic caloric restriction experiments uh, which are involved in extending lifespan, both in, in mammals. <clears throat> so I've already shown you some examples of how the clock system is embedded within metabolic pathways. Uh, this is just another view showing <clears throat> a number of well-known metabolic pathways that are directly connected uh, to the clock transcriptional loop. Uh, and these connections go both ways. Um, but importantly, <clears throat> we also know that there are interesting uh, metabolic consequences of nutrient intake at different times of day. So here's one example. We all know that if we feed C57 black six mice on a high fat diet, they become obese. <clears throat> but if you restrict food access to only the nighttime, and these mice eat the same amount of food in that shorter interval, these mice no longer become obese. Uh, in contrast, if you feed those mice high-fat diet only in the daytime, then they become obese. So there's a huge uh, difference in the metabolic consequence of high-fat diet, depending on when the mice uh, eat either at the bright time, that's the night time for mice, or the wrong time, the daytime. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one example. Uh, and we got interested in caloric restriction <clears throat> because this manipulation is the most effective way of uh, extending lifespan in animals. So for example, a 30% reduction in caloric intake in mice and rats will uh, extend lifespan by 30%. That's a whole year of additional uh, life for a mouse that lives uh, at the most three years, okay? Uh, but if you look at these classic experiments and how they were conducted, uh, we see a very interesting feeding pattern. So here, for example, uh, mice were fed four feedings per week, one on Monday, one on Wednesday, and then one on Friday, okay? So there are two problems with this. The, it actually says mornings. So the mice are being fed in the daytime. That's the wrong time for mice. And they're not being fed every day. So the mice are uh, given <clears throat> two days of food on Monday, two days of food on Wednesday, and three days of food on Friday, okay? In between, uh, they have to fast. So we wanted to look into this more carefully, uh, and we looked into uh, five conditions initially, ad-lib feeding, time restriction night or day, or caloric restriction where we give the food at the beginning of the day or the beginning of the night. Now, the reason, of course, that 
these longevity experiments were done in this fashion here, whoops, wrong way, um, is that the experiment takes four, four years to complete. And um, no graduate student, postdoc, or staff member is going to be feeding mice every day for four years. Um, and so that's why weekends are always skipped in these kinds of experiments. So to get around this problem, what we had to do was to develop an automated feeding system. So we would go to pelleted food. These are 300 milligram food pellets. Uh, and they are adopted to our activity system. And so we can monitor both activity and when the pellet is given and when the mouse takes the pellet. So here's an actogram of a typical mouse on ad lib feeding. Uh, the black shows when it's running on the wheel. It's on a light cycle for the whole experiment. And then the red dots show when it's eating a pellet. So ad lib mice eat 14 pellets a day. They eat three quarters or 75% of their food at night, but they do also eat during the daytime. Okay? Now, if we restrict food to either the night or the day, just time restriction, no restriction on the amount, uh, then what we see is um, the mice are pretty normal, at, especially when we feed them at night. Uh, they also tolerate feeding in the daytime. Their activity does not shift over. Uh, only their metabolic organs shift over, as I'll sh show you in a moment, when you shift the food cycle. But when you put mice on caloric restriction, we got a surprise. So this is uh, mice where the the, the, feed, the food are, becomes available at the beginning of the night or the beginning of the day. Now, we thought that night feeding would be better, but it turned out that as the mice get restricted, they eat the food as soon as they can get it. So we introduce a 10-minute delay between each pellet. So these mice only get 11 pellets a day, so they can eat all of the, the food in 110 minutes, and that's exactly what they're doing. So what we found is that calorically restricted mice are self-imposing time restriction, very severe time restriction. Um, they're not just being calorically restricted, they're also time restricted. And they're going through almost a 22-hour fast every day. Okay? Uh, the surprise was that, was that night feeding was actually more disruptive. It, it caused them to actually run in the daytime here, which is very unusual. Um, now, here's their food intake. So here's ad lib at 14 pellets a day. Time restricted at night can eat 14 pellets. Daytime feeding mice eat two pellets less, and then these are the calorically restricted mice. And one of the really interesting uh, features that came out of this is that in the calorically restricted mice, only the mice that eat at night uh, lose weight. Even when the mice are calorically restricted, if they eat that food in the daytime, they do not lose weight. Uh, translated to human biology, it suggests that if you're on a diet and you're eating your food at the wrong time of day, in the middle of the night, you might not lose weight. Uh, and it'll be interesting uh, to see if this translates to human biology. So we then undertook a longevity experiment. We decided to go back to a more classic time restriction of only six hours instead of 12. And then we tried to mimic the caloric restriction to try to spread it out to six hours. So this is the design that we initially uh, started for a longevity experiment to see if time restriction by itself may have benefits similar to caloric restriction. And so these are activity records. This is for the first six months or so for these six groups. Um, and these are the body weight uh, plots for the first six months. And again, what we see is that uh, caloric restriction at night, this group, is the only group that doesn't gain that much weight over the six-month period. Even though these mice are calorically restricted, they still gain weight. And if we look at time restriction, we see a similar day-night difference. These mice at night uh, are eating 
uh, 14 pellets. These mice here in the daytime are eating 12 pellets, but they gain more weight because they're eating it at the wrong time. Okay? And if we look at gene expression in the liver, uh, we see that time restriction at night actually increases the number of cycling genes significantly. Time restriction in the day blunts this number, and then caloric restriction either in the night or the day uh, leads to a very large increase in the number of cycling genes and their amplitude. Uh, if we look at the timing of these genes uh, compared to ad lib, so here's ad lib on the x axis compared to either um, caloric restriction at night or time restriction at night, we see that the phases are the same. They're on this diagonal with a slope of one. But if they're fed in the daytime, uh, then the liver shifts over almost 180 degrees, uh, and also there's more scatter. So this Feeding manipulation completely reprograms the circadian pattern of gene expression in the liver. Uh, and if we compare these five conditions, in the middle we see a small set of genes highly enriched for circadian pathways. And then each of these other categories have their own enriched set of genes. Uh, and we're trying to explore uh, what might be interesting pathways that are uniquely induced by either time restriction or caloric restriction. So finally, we are one year into this uh, longevity experiment, uh, and an unfortunate thing happened. The time-restricted mice self-impose caloric restriction. For some reason, their set point went down, uh, and at the end of one year, they're eating only 12 pellets a day voluntarily, but this is calorically restricted relative to the ad lib group. And so this completely compromised our experiment because we could no longer discriminate between calories and time because both sets of groups uh, were both calorically restricted <laughs> as well as time restricted. Okay. So, we had to actually shut that experiment down, start over. And so this is our current new design. We've gone back to 12-hour time restriction, which we know is going to be similar to ad lib, because they can eat as much food in 12 hours as the ad lib mice do, day and night. And then we've added new caloric restriction groups. So here's the original one I showed you, where they eat all the food in two hours. Uh, this may be the, the most beneficial one in the classic experiments, we don't know. And then what we've done is to restrict, or I mean spread out the calorically restricted food access over 12 hours in the day or night to try to more match the pattern of time restriction. And then we finally have another group that has no day-night difference. We spread the food out over 24 hours. And this experiment is working. We're one year into it. The mice eat exactly in this pattern uh, as we dole out the food. Uh, and luckily, the time-restricted night group is still eating as much as ad lib. And so we're hoping with this design, we will be able to definitively answer whether time restriction itself will have benefits as far as longevity and health span is concerned. We can already see health span benefits, uh, but lifespan will be the critical variable. Uh, and whether the timing or pattern of caloric restriction is really critical or makes a difference. Uh, I'm really excited about this experiment uh, because if time restriction uh, is effective in extending lifespan, this is going to be a much easier intervention for us as humans to adopt uh, than caloric restriction. It's almost impossible for a human to maintain 30% caloric uh, restriction over your lifetime. If you uh, give it up, there's no benefit. You have to maintain it to have this longevity benefit. Uh, but many people now actually have adopted time-restricted diets uh, of some sort or another, uh, and they are actually something that you can, can do. Uh, so we're really excited about this, but we're going to have to wait three more years for the answer. Okay, so I'm gonna stop there.
Um, and the really important people are highlighted in yellow. Uh, these are the people who discovered the clock gene a long time ago. Uh, and then the chip seek work was done by Nuobu Koike and TK Kim, uh, as well as Nohan Park. Uh, and then the uh, longevity experiments were done by Vicky Acosta in uh, collaboration with Carla Green. Thank you very much. Thanks for our marvelous talk. We have time for a question or two. Sure. Thank you for a fascinating talk. Uh, just a question on what do you think explains the uh, biphasic response to light in the clock? Why at certain times it phase advances, then phase delays? Uh, I didn't catch the beginning of your question about phase advances and phase delays to light. Yes, yeah, so l l light in the evening will phase delay, light in the, the daytime will phase advance. Yes. Uh, what is it in the clock that, uh, that explains that sort of biphasic response? Ah, okay, so um, if you think about the clock as, uh, say, a per oscillation, and we know that light induces PER at all times of day. When PER is high, it has no effect because it's already high. But when PER is low and light increases it, then that leads to a change uh, in the entire clock feedback loop. Uh, and at the beginning, it will delay uh, at the beginning of the night. And in the morning, it will actually advance. Um, and so. The, the signal is actually operating on the clock transcriptional network in the same direction, uh, even though the light can either delay or advance, because it, it depends on the phase at which that happens relative to oscillator cycle. Yes? Thank you very much. I'm sure we'll all be very eager to hear your results when they finally come to full fruition, the very challenging work that you're embarking on. Um, and I was just wondering whether you had any idea why the mice reduced their intake from 14 to 12 pellets. So um, forgive my ignorance of the field, were they getting a bit depressed? Um, <laughs> or, you know, I don't know if depressed mice eat less, sorry for my ignorance. Um, so, or are there other factors and is that something worth looking at in your paradigms? Um, other things that might be affected, mood, anxiety, etc. please. Right, so um, we have tested the cognition of the mice uh, using context-dependent fear conditioning. Uh, so far, we didn't see any significant uh, changes in that particular learning task. Uh, we don't have very good um, behavioral measures of depression, uh, and so perhaps that's something we should actually look at. One possibility for why they reduce their caloric intake is that mice um, have another way of dealing with food deprivation, uh, and that is to lower their body temperature and go into torpor. And so we're investigating whether uh, these feeding cycles are inducing a torpor. They, they tend to lower their body temperature every day if they're starved. And if they're doing that, that could explain why their steady state caloric intake would go down. So that's a possibility. Kind of along the same line, over here. <laughs> um, did you guys, because you talk about feed manipulation, recessive circadian rhythm expression. So with those time restricted, did, like what was the difference in terms of their expression and did they revert back to, is their expression identical to the caloric restricted mouse once? Yeah, so is there a difference in gene expression between time restriction and caloric restriction? Well, the mouse that ended up eating the 12 pallets. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, we can't, I mean, we, we can't say it's the calories. All we can tell, say is the condition was different. There are still many thousands of genes that are different between or among those five categories. Uh, so there's no single factor that has fallen out yet that can really explain why they might have gone down. Uh, 
We'll take one last question. Uh, thank you for this amazing talk because it's so beautiful to see complexity uh, and simplicity and cl uh, clinical relevance. So uh, my question goes to the last part of your talk is, if we restrict timing-wise, you know, actually if you are a lark or an owl, uh, restricting um, relative to the clock time rather than relative to the, uh, sorry, relative to the circadian time, relative, uh, in contrast to the clock time, would, according to some uh, experiments, make uh, more sense. So in that way, if someone is phase delayed, um, we would impose additional maybe hardship by uh, actually creating a mismatch uh, right there. Or the same probably in animals would be if we phase delay the mouse um, and uh, the, the question is would it be the same, results would be the same or it will, they will follow the endogenous time. Yeah, that's a very good point. So I think that um, as you point out, if we want to apply this idea to humans, uh, it will be important to assess the chronotype of that in individual to see if they're either delayed or advanced. Most of us are on the delay side. Uh, and then we would then have to adjust to try to see what the optimum phase would be for each individual, de depending on their chronotype. So these are all things that I think are going to be uh, relatively feasible in the near future, uh, not so difficult to assess a person's chronotype. Join me in thanking Dr. Takahashi Thank for his talk.